Welcome back. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the first lecture of uh, Professor Francesco Ginelli from Università dell'Insubria in Italy. And he's going to tell us all about the physics of flocking, which is quite interesting, one of the first main topics in active matter. And uh, yes, please, thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you for having me here. It's my first time in Sao Paulo. And uh, well, for the one of you who doesn't know me, uh, I am based uh, in uh, Como, which is a small town north of Milano. We have historically a presence in complex system and linear dynamics at Mac. And after a little bit of touring of Europe, uh, I went back to Italy and establish a small group. So sometimes we also hire. So unfortunately, if we don't get European projects, we hire on the Italian salary scale, which is not exactly Germany. But uh, have a look for us if you are looking for positions. Sometimes we hire. OK. Um, where do we start? Ah, of course, uh, OK. Uh, Aparna mentioned the, the excellent reason for attending school in person. Another one she forgot to mention is to have beer with friends uh, after. And I'm also realized I'm the last one before you and the beer, and this is the fourth lecture of the day. So I understand it's going to be a little bit hard, but let's try to, to, stay, to stay with me. OK, uh, well, we already introduced active matter, of course, but this is a school on active matter. Aparna said something. Uh, from my point of view, or some kind of paradigm for active matter, is of course uh, uh, a system made of, cost of fundamental constituents which are able to extract and dissipate energy to uh, exert uh, forces, coherent self-propelled forces, typically. Okay? So these are systems which are out of equilibrium. And, uh, of course, not all out-of-equilibrium systems are considered to be active matter, traditionally. The idea is that uh, the energy in active matter system enters and acts and gets dissipated at the individual particle level. Okay, so, I mean, so not by boundaries, not by some other system, but it's something which happens uh, at the level of the individual. Okay. And uh, also, it should enter in a way which doesn't explicitly break uh, the symmetries of the system. So if you just apply an electric field uh, which points in a certain direction and move charged particle, most of the people who doesn't will not consider as active matter. OK, why we do care? Oh, well, first of all, consequences. Let's go in order. Of course, since uh, we are breaking equilibrium as, as a partner, mentioned, there are certain features of equilibrium system with, which we lack. So in, specifically, we don't have a time reversal symmetry and detail balance, which are cornerstone of equilibrium physics. As a consequence, we don't have uh, a Boltzmann statistics to guide us, typically. But uh, as a reward for all of these uh, lifting of constraint, which makes, of course, uh, the life of a theoretician harder to analyze the system. There is also an extremely rich uh, dynamical phenomenology which gets freed out, which you cannot find in equilibrium system. Okay? And as a physicist, this is basically what excites me about uh, this system. Uh, beyond this consideration, why it matters to be active, uh, well, first of all, well, uh, Parna discussed uh, what is life. Uh, to me, life is basically uh, a struggle to be out of equilibrium. Okay? As long as you get to equilibrium, you are dead. So you better stay out of equilibrium. So active matter is uh, a way to describe living matter. And so it has a lot of biophysical application which are obvious. And in more recent years, uh, there has been the hope that all of this rich dynamical phenomenology, which uh, we are still exploring to a large extent, can at a certain point be useful for some, let's say, technological application or anyhow, like 
developing smart materials, smart synthetic materials based on active matter systems. Okay? Here, the, the blueprint, I think, it's always uh, what happened with liquid crystal in soft matter physics uh, some decades ago. Okay? Uh, of course, before I get more specific, as I told you, there are, of course, many ways of driving a system out of equilibrium. Here, there are just three examples where, basically, I am driving it from the boundaries. Uh, I'm putting some external field in a very blatant way, which breaks any symmetry. Or, slightly more subtle, I'm introducing an absorbing state, state which traps the dynamics. These are all ways of breaking uh, equilibrium which are considered outside the realm of uh, active matter. Exactly since uh, this injection and dissipation of energy does not take place uh, at the individual particle level. Okay, this is... Sorry? The third picture is some uh, reaction diffusion process with an absorbing state. I took it more or less at random. I don't remember if it's, per, if it's directed percolation or it looks, maybe it's directed percolation above threshold. It doesn't look like exactly critical, but it's still uh, nevertheless an absorbing state system. Uh, okay, so this is where I typically start with introduction. You have seen a lot of these, so there is not so much need uh, to, to, to stress uh, this point, but uh, in active matter, typically, we, well, there is a jargon, of course, which is useful to learn, also useful to learn what is behind. So the simplest active system which people have been looking at are these uh, kind of uh, active Brownian particle and run and tumble particle you have already seen, and they go under the name of uh, scalar active matter. They are scalar since uh, when you try to describe them at the theoretical level, all you need uh, is a scalar field, typically, density. Okay? This is not the case of uh, the pneumatic system introduced by, by Julia. Okay, she stayed passive this morning, but, uh, but they will become active, I guess, and uh, these are not scalar active matter since they have uh, well, a tensor order parameter, even more than a vector once. <laughs> needed to describe them, which is this pneumatic tensor. But if you stay at the level of this scalar particle, we will discover, or you will discover in other courses of this series, of this school, that uh, all you need to describe them is basically describe the density field, which is scalar. Uh, okay, so you, you have seen this kind of two examples, active Brownian particle and run and tumble particles. It's very interesting to work out their dynamics. They, this has been mentioned, their blueprint for this kind of system came, for instance, from biology. Bacteria, many bacteria done a run and tumble motion where they move more or they self propel themselves more or less in a straight way by their flagella, and uh, occasionally they stop, they reorient themselves. In all mathematical idealization, the reorienting time is much shorter than uh, the, the time in which they run in a straight line, so typically gets ignored, or you can also add a farther time scale, but it doesn't matter much, but let's say, let's stay simple, and then restart again, okay? Or other kind of uh, system, like, uh, as we mentioned, eukaryotic cells, they like to crawl over a substrate, so they self-propel, and they slowly, this, in this case, they slowly and constantly change direction. Okay? Constantly in the sense that they have fluctuation acting on their direction of motion in a, in a more or less constant way. And so they, they do this active Brownian particle, which is less straight and is, is more, in a sense, looks a little bit more continuous at this level of course graining. Uh, there are other simple idealization that the most probably known third class is Ornstein Uhlenbeck particles where you also allow the speed of a particle to fluctuate. In, in all of these uh, modelization, as you can see, oh, sorry here, it's worth nothing. Uh, sorry. 
Okay, your particle basically move uh, in this overdump description with uh, a constant speed. Okay, you have to understand. We will come this, to this to a moment, but this is an idealization, and it's due to the fact that you're exerting a force and you're dissipating uh, energy over a substrate or moving uh, in some viscous fluid. Okay, this is basically the complete physics uh, of the model, which gets dramatically simplified by this overdamped uh, limit. Uh, so there are models where you also let uh, this velocity fluctuate. Uh, there are other examples, also this one Rodrigo mentioned. These are um, autophoretic colloids. Okay. Uh, typically, the, the trick to have cell propulsion is to have uh, some anisotropy, so you should distinguish be between the head and the tail of the particle. So here you have little spheres which get plated uh, over half of them, uh, here in this case with um, uh, platinum, okay, which happens to be a reactant for a certain chemical reaction. And this chemical reaction creates uh, an osmotic flow, which covers, go, runs around the particle, and the osmotic flows essentially self-propel your particle. Okay, and also these particles, since uh, so they, they move in the direction of these arrows, since also they have a little bit of random torques uh, by basically coll a collision in the solvent, uh, they they do a persistent random walk in isolation. Uh, Maybe simpler system are shaken granular matter, shaken of polar disks. This is a, an old experiment by the Shalab. Here the idea is uh, you take a, um, a plate, and uh, on the plate you put a lot of little disks. As I told you, you need to break uh, the polar symmetry, the, 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 the rotational symmetry, sorry and to get polar. So you have, uh, between head and tail, different uh, materials uh, which create different friction coefficient. And then you shake vertically the substrate. There is also a glass on top to avoid uh, your particle to flow off. So they are confined in a two-dimensional plate. But basically, vertical vibration make them jump up and, uh, up and down. And by dissipation, the, the, the this, these two sides, as I told you, are different, and so you create uh, an apolar symmetry, and they move uh, polarly in a certain direction. Okay, and then of course there is a lot uh, of uh, noise sources, and so also this one tend to rotate uh, in an active Brownian fashion. Okay. Now, you will probably see it tomorrow. I just sorry anticipate very quickly, but you will see that. Uh, Taking alone uh, this kind of particle are essentially persistent random walkers, which means that uh, on a sufficiently short time scales, they, they self-propel and they move ballistically. But since at a certain point they're going to turn around, if you leave them alone in an infinite system, they will just be effective random walkers. Okay, of course, the temperature of this random walk, uh, which you work it out for fluctuation dissipation, will not be the ambient temperature, will be an effective temperature which is given basically by the self-propelling force, which means by the energy you are injecting from outside. It's nothing to do with thermal agitation of the surrounding fluid uh, or whatever. But th the main message is that if you look them enough, from far enough, uh, these are random walkers with some effective hot temperature. Things, uh, I mean, but of course these are non-equilibrium objects, uh, and so this non-equilibrium nature became apparent when you start to consider interaction between these particles. In okay. particular, when you start to go beyond the simple idealization of point particle and you start to think of objects which have a size, and they have some repulsion, so they, they have volume exclusion, so when they collide, something happens. Typically, you can do models where you put, uh, here, I've added uh, a, 
some repulsive force, which has a short range, is basically the radius of a particle. They are not really hard, since for modeling reason is more difficult, but there is an harmonic potential which happens until a certain cutoff, which is the diameter of the spheres. Okay, so basically, when they get too close to one each other, they also get, tend to repel. And in the meantime, they also self-propel themselves. Okay? So basically, their velocities start to be different from their self-propulsion, since their velocity is the combination of these two terms. When you do this, a lot of interest in physics came out. Okay? Uh, basically, uh, two, two things you will learn probably in the next days, which is a phase separation induced by motility, which can happen without any attractive force, which is something unheard of in equilibrium system. This is a novelty. I mean, if you want to have things to clamp in equilibrium, you need attractive force. You need potential like the, the Leonard-Jones potential you have mentioned today. Uh, another thing you can do is you can rectify fluctuations, which means that, uh, for instance, if you put a gear in a bacterial bath, uh, these gears start to rotate, which is something you cannot do in Brownian motion. Otherwise, uh, the second law of thermodynamic uh, would fly off the window, which would be very nice, but is not the case. But here, we, with, with bacteria, uh, you can do this. Okay. So all of these things are very nice, but I'm not going to talk any more of this. I'm just noting one thing, uh, that uh, as soon as you have uh, two stuff, even if they are spheres colliding, now in this modelization, I said, well, I add the force here on the position, which takes into account the fact uh, that it's this little red arrow that there is repulsion. But there is no reason on Earth, uh, there is no symmetry, unless uh, your, your spheres are perfectly frictionless, which is not the case in the real world. There is no reason for which you should not get, on top of this repulsion, which acts on the center of mass, some torque which wants to rotate your object, okay? This is pretty evident if uh, your colliding objects are not perfect spheres, which happens in most of the case, but even if they are perfect spheres, and you have some friction, the, the interaction with the propulsion will create some torque. Now, this torque, the following, uh, here I try to put a little bit of arrows, so the red one is the repulsion, the blue one is the self-propulsion, is where your particle wants to go, okay, where the, the, their self-propulsion pushes, and uh, so they generate a total velocity, which is the sum of this red arrow here and this blue arrow here. Let's say it's this one and this one for the other. Now, the torque can do two things. Can either rotate the particle in a way that the self-propulsion goes towards the, the velocity or in the other way. Okay? In many cases, I don't think there is a... But in, in many cases, it goes... Uh, to al tends to align your self propulsion with your velocity. Okay? So there, there is a, a fun interaction, and uh, a, a simple model for this kind of situation, which is still overdamped, uh, is this one. This is exactly my active Brownian particle with the repulsion which is acting on the center of mass. And then I added the second term, which is a torque, one over tau. Uh, tau here is the typical time needed to, to, to rotate, so it's the inverse, uh, if you want, of, of the strength of this torque. And uh, here theta is uh, the orientation of the cell propulsion, and phi is the orientation of the total velocity. So this term here will tend to align your cell propulsion towards the velocity. And since it came from an interaction, uh, this kind of model is enough if tau is small enough to induce uh, a global aligning of your particle. Basically, the game is, uh, it's like uh, you are in a crowd, uh, everyone is moving in a certain direction, but uh, since uh, you tend to get crushed, uh, 
certain point, you go with the flow. If people is pushing you from, from behind, you don't try to go against the crowd. You, you just go along with the crowd. And everyone does this. So as a torque which aligns with the pressure, if you want, with the direction where the pressure is exerted, you end up moving all in the same direction. Okay? So in a sense, uh, uh, pure scalar active matter without alignment is some kind of idealization. Of course, it's not given that uh, this alignment force, sorry, this alignment force, uh, hello, hmm, there is a certain lag. Maybe this alignment force is not enough uh, to, to promote uh, global alignment, uh, but uh, in many situations uh, you get there. Okay, so this is uh, some kind of generic story, yes? Oh, sorry, yes, here I... I, I uh, no, 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 this is the um, velocity of a single particle. Okay, it's the same it, it, velocity. It's it, 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 the sum of these two terms. Okay. So this is our dot. Okay, I see. But there so is still an interaction. It. If you want, it, it's not totally obvious that these things can promote a global alignment. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is uh, some kind of uh, mathematical demonstration that it can do it, but uh, phenomenology there is. Uh, Ah, okay, you are more. Okay, thank you. Okay, nice. I have to read it. Uh, but it does. Okay, so after this long introduction, the point is this is where I'm going to focus. Not so much on this model, even if it will resurface at a certain point, but more generally on the system where all the particles at a certain point, a self proper particle, they all start to move in the same direction, more or less. Okay? These systems are called flocking systems, and these are systems which does uh, collective motion. Collective motion means they all move uh, in the same direction. Okay? Now, the, the crucial point uh, of, these, uh, of these systems is that uh, they break a symmetry that, in principle, uh, your particles can go in any direction. Okay, for simplicity, think of particles moving in a plane, but then you can generalize to three dimensions, if you like. But all particles uh, can move in different directions. There is nothing which tells them they have to go north and they don't have to go east or, north or northwest, okay? But, uh, so, in a sense, the system is rotational invariant. There is no clue at all which tells them that direction is better than that one. Okay? But uh, by this alignment uh, interaction, which of course are local, as in this example, which came from local collision, they can somehow spread uh, the information and synchronize their direction of motion. This is called uh, symmetry breaking. Okay, spontaneous symmetry breaking, since there is no one which is telling them to go there or to go there. Of course, the fact that no one will tell, is telling them where to go, it means that the direction they will choose collectively is totally random. Okay? It's determined by the fluctuation, since there, are, there is a noise with the source of fluctuation, the initial condition, whatever, but it's totally random. Okay. Uh, the other important, of course, the fact that system can break uh, a continuous symmetry to, to synchronize their orientation is not at all new physics. This is a well-known uh, subject, uh, at least from the 70s. I mean, ferromagnet uh, beyond easing. Okay, the easing model is a particular model of ferromagnet. Actually, is a model of uniaxial ferromagnet, since in the Isaac model, your spin, your magnetic momenta can align either up or down. There is nothing else possible. But uh, in a model of ferromagnet, where the spin can are free to, to run, for instance, on a plane or even in three dimension, these are constrained and released, and your system has uh, 
a continuous symmetry, since there is an infinity of direction where you spin can point. Okay? And this is a, a well-studied argument. I mean, Nobel Prizes have been given, basically, for this kind of work. Uh, and it's been explored extensively in equilibrium. The novelty is that uh, now this is coupled with uh, self-propulsion of your particle. Okay? So you have your, 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 your particle are not constrained to, to stay still and just point in different direction, but they also move in the direction where they point. Okay. And uh, one of the messages of these lectures is that uh, a lot uh, of the physics of these systems, regardless of many, many details you can dress your system with, is just determined by these two facts alone. Okay? And this tells you a lot about uh, the physics of the system, or better, of the large-scale physics of your system. Okay? Of course, small-scale details uh, I mean, small are determined by the, 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 the details, the fine details of your systems. There are many ways, of course, in which you can break your symmetry and you can self-propel. And these are going to matter on the short scale, either spatial or time scale. But as you know, and physics tells you that if you go far enough away, all of this is not going to matter anymore, to very large extents. Of course, there are always some details which escape this, but in general, this is the message. Uh, of course, the system we have in mind, uh, this is where probably everything started in the mind of Thomas Witschek in 95, and the synchronization between these two things is terrible. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Well, principal birds. Okay? This is a flock of birds. Starlings. And they are not flocking since they're frozen. Uh, they are just flocking on my screen. Then okay. They are very, very slowly flocking. By the way, if you're interested in animal behavior, this is a predator. So this is a falcon. And these are probably a thousand or two thousand of starling flocks. And essentially the game, you probably know, is uh, the falcon wants to eat the starlings. The starlings, not surprisingly, would prefer not to be eaten. And so they stay all together since the falcon doesn't like to charge into the group. Actually, charging into a dense group uh, can damage uh, the wings of the falcon. So the falcon circles uh, this flock and tries uh, to scare them, okay, you cannot see it. Try to, to scare them away uh, in a way that someone gets lost uh, and, and becomes a prey. Okay? So the, 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 the game of the, of the bird is fly in the same direction and stay close one to each other. Uh, yet. Movies are not really on the yeah, probably it's the internet, but okay. Well, yeah, yeah, but anyhow, no problem. Uh, these are sheep. If you're interested, came to me with a beer and we showed you nothing important. These are sheep all moving together, try to, to jump. If, anyway, there is a small passage between two, two fields. They really became, be, behave like some kind of liquid. And these are fish, a school of fish. Okay, all example of... This is some kind of high-level idealization, since uh, what uh, I am telling you is that a bird uh, is uh, an active particle. So it's basically something which has a position, which has a direction of motion. I don't care at all all the details how this guy managed to fly, how these guys manage with internal metabolism to uh, consume energy and to self-propel. To me, they are just little arrows which move. Okay, in a sense. Uh, we go back to this later, why this is meaningful. Okay. Uh, bacteria colonies also. We have seen before that bacteria are typically self propelled particles. When you put many of them together by local interaction, they form cluster which uh, tend to move collectively. Here, the color coding is artificial and is 
given according to the direction in which they move. Uh, ah, this is nice. Uh, oh, maybe this one you can see it. Okay. This is uh, cellular migration. This is uh, an embryo of a zebrafish. I don't know if you know the zebrafish. The zebrafish is a very small fish, uh, which is very popular with the biologists, uh, since uh, it's uh, very, very transparent, okay? During uh, many stages of its life, I think all. So being, many, being very, very transparent let you image uh, very well the zebrafish, especially the embryo is transparent, without killing it, okay? So, uh, it's possible to image these things you see here are single cells. Okay, so you can image the single cells without killing the embryo, and so you can follow the, uh, the development of the embryo. And the, the phenomenon you've been seeing, uh, this kind of protrusion here, is a collective migration of uh, cells, uh, which uh, is needed Basically, it, it's, it's the first step of uh, what will become uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the chordal spine of the fish, okay? And this is something which happens in all the vertebrates. It starts also to create the bilateral symmetry and all of this stuff. But so the cellular migration is a very important part of this process. Of course, you may wonder if this is spontaneous. It probably is not. Probably there is some kind of gradient of chemicals, but still there is a cellular migration going on, and that's very interesting to analyze. This is other kind of cells. These are epithelial cells, and this is an in vitro experiment which is trying to study the way we heal wounds, I mean, which living tissue heals cuts, okay? So this is another kind of cellular migration. And okay, well, you can go on and on and on, but anyhow, movies doesn't look very good today, so I will stop it here. So, this is more or less uh, the, the, the motivation, and the rough plan of these talks, uh, I'm not sure where I could manage to arrive, is to start from a phenological description of the system, basically starting with uh, simple elementary microscopic models, and I will try to justify this. So this idea, let's just put uh, small arrows in place of these birds or these cells. Uh, I will discuss some experimental evidence to show that this approach can predict uh, some important properties. Uh, and I will discuss a little bit the physics at the phenological level. And then uh, I will go to the celebrated hydrodynamic theory of tolerant 2. I will try to give you an elementary work through, through the theory, so it will be a little bit more theoretical. And if time permits, uh, I will touch some more recent result of my research, uh, which regards the effect of external perturbation and boundaries on this system. But I'm not sure I will have the time. Okay, so uh, why? We want to use little arrows instead of our birds. Well, the, 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 key, the key idea is universality. Now, but in general, you, you, you can scale back, okay, before you go... Uh, by the way, who is not a physicist here? May I make jokes on biologists? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I have a great respect for biologists. Uh, no, but okay, before you try to go to talk with the biologist, try to convince them that uh, it's a good idea that they care about what you did with little arrows to describe their biological systems, you may wonder why on earth uh, we are studying uh, little arrows to understand uh, uniaxial ferromagnet or planar ferromagnet. I mean, of course, there is much more stuff uh, even in uh, molecules, atoms, and so on, that little errors, but why we gain valuable insights by the Ising model or the XY model, okay? The idea is exactly the same. Okay, the idea is that uh, there are some fundamental properties which essentially, we try to justify these in the next lecture. So basically, these are the symmetries of a problem and the conservation laws of your problem which 
are the, the only things which determine uh, the long wavelength uh, and long time scale properties of your system. Okay, so the idea, and this is the idea of universite which came out uh, technically for renormalization group studies uh, developed in the, uh, in the second half of the last century, okay, which is one of the probably pillars of, uh, of statistical physics, of the main result of statistical physics. But uh, beyond uh, the, the technical aspect of this thing, uh, the importance of this result uh, is that tells you, okay, if you are careful enough uh, to identify the important feature of the model you are studying, one, and two, if you care only about things which can be seen from sufficiently far away, in scale and in time, okay, which, which these are two big ifs, eh? but if you do these two things, uh, you're perfectly allowed to use simple models. And simple models are easy to simulate, are easy to solve analytically, are easy to, to be understood. So this is the strength of statistical physics in analyzing the world. Okay? So basically, use simple models to capture essential phenomena. This is something we started to do in condensed matter. And then, after the great success physicists had in condensed matter, we moved uh, to other domains, okay? And one of them is biology and activity. This is basically why we are doing this approach, okay? Of course, it's all, we are also doing this approach since this is what we know how to do it, okay? This is our job. Other things, uh, there are better people better prepared than us. Of course, of course, you should also always be careful since, uh, as I told you, there are a lot of if in what... Uh, in, in this kind of approach, and so many details may be important, especially since uh, uh, when you do condensed matter, you typically think about Avogadro number of particles. When you do biology, typically it's difficult to have an Avogadro number of uh, births, okay? So, to a certain extent, you should remember that your system are not that close to the thermodynamic limit, but some other feature may appear, but of course biologists may be interested in other things uh, beyond uh, these uh, large scale limits and so on and so forth. So you should also, in a sense, be careful and not let your hubris uh, blind you. Nevertheless, uh, this kind of approach can give you a lot of valuable insight, at least uh, of some kind of uh, large scale behavior which may guide uh, Late, some kind of later refinement uh, to capture more and more short scale details. I mean, so instead of going blindly, putting uh, basically by chance uh, all the details you can think of and you may believe uh, that are important, you start with the fundamental one symmetry, conservation laws, and so on and so forth. And then only after that uh, you can try to, to build more. Okay? This is basically the idea of the approach. Okay, so with these things in mind, uh, now I, I introduce a model which now is almost 30 years old, which is uh, the equivalent, if you want, to this model in this field, which is the Dicek model, which uh, is a model of flying arrows. A few more, okay? So you have uh, particles which uh, live uh, in open space, in continuous space. They are not constrained on a lattice. They move uh, with constant speed in the direction they point. So particles have a position and have a direction of self-propulsion. And uh, they interact uh, locally by some ferromagnetic or polar interaction which, uh, okay, in the original model, and for now we are considering this, so they have a certain finite range, let's say one meter, whatever, and they try to take the same direction of all the other particles in this range. And there is some white noise uh, which uh, tells them you're not perfect in playing this game, and uh, this noise will play the role of a temperature in equilibrium system. Of course, these are not equilibrium systems, okay? This is... Uh, the, the basic idea. We will mainly restrict ourselves to two spatial dimensions, which is where it's easier to write the equation, and of course, you can also study this system in three dimensions, this has been done, etc. But 
for the moment, uh, let's fix it in two dimension, and you may write your equation like this. So you have a position. Here, the dynamics for simplicity is discrete. So you, you, uh, I'm really not writing continuous time differential equation. I have a discrete dynamics. The idea is that nothing changes on the large time scales. So your position after a certain time delta t is given by the original position of each particle i plus the self-propulsion. You have this fixed speed with zero. And OK, of course, by dt. At a certain point, we will put dt equal to 1. It's just a simple rescaling of time scale, harmless. And uh, si is a unit vector which tells you where you want to move. Okay? In two dimensions, your unit vector is determined by an angle. And uh, the dynamic of the angle is, uh, this is a complex way of telling you, look at everyone which is uh, close by and uh, take the average of their direction and go in that direction. Okay? Uh, okay. So the way I wrote it, so arg is the argument. So it's the one you, 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 you feed the vector to to the arg function in two dimension and returns the angle. And the argument of the argument, so here what's inside is the, the sum of all the nearby particle. Nij is a connectivity matrix, if you want, is an interaction matrix, which is either one if uh, particle j is close enough to particle r, or zero if uh, you're outside. Okay? This is a notation which is useful then to understand one essential feature of this model, which is, uh, you can see this as a network model. Okay, oh, there is a network, I'm interacting with a few of the other particles of the network. Peculiarity, the point is that uh, the network changes dynamically. Here there is a T, which says that your network is constantly rearranging, and it doesn't rearrange at random. Rearrange is a consequence of the relative change in the position of the particle. So if you have two particles which are close by, then maybe one may decide by a fluctuation to move in this direction, the other moves in this direction, and they will change their neighbors. They will not be any more neighbors, okay? So this matrix changes in, non -trivial, way, in a non-trivial way, which is feed by the difference in the relative velocities of your particle. And then, of course, there is a noise uh, with here I extracted eta, which is a scalar amplitude for this noise, and this noise is uh, zero average delta correlated, etc. Okay, so it, it's a very, very, very simple model. Uh, one message is that the fact that uh, this uh, connectivity matrix is, uh, uh, is dynamically changing will make this system formally out of equilibrium. Okay? Not that there is a lot, a lot of abstraction to, to get to this model. We started from this idea that there is a flux of energy entering your system at the particle level. The particles are dissipating it, uh, let's say, to move, and they may interact between them. Here, there is no, not anymore any trace of the flux of energy directly. There is no dissipation. All of these uh, has been basically included in the fact that these are basically first-order equations. Okay? They are not anymore Newtonian equation with an inertia. They are first-order equation. There is, this, there is a balance between implicit balance between dissipation and self-propulsion, which fixed the, the velocity with zero. Okay? This is basically a stupid example. When you drive, uh, you keep... Uh, at a constant, you keep a constant pressure on the gas pedal, okay? This means you keep exerting a force since this force needs to balance the friction of the environment around you to keep a constant uh, velocity, okay? This is all a situation which uh, is implicit here, okay? So after all of these uh, elimination of degrees of freedom, one may wonder where the non-equilibrium feature stands up, and it stands up exactly in the fact that this connectivity matrix here is time-dependent. And we will see this later, probably, in the next lecture. Okay, but keeping this in mind, this is very important. This is a cartoon of the model. 
Uh, so here I have a red particle, which is my protagonist. Uh, the red particle has an interaction range. It looks around, uh, say, ah, oh, these three guys are in my interaction. I want to go where they're going. Let's take the average. More or less, uh, it takes the average. And there is some noisy thing, as I told you. Uh, here. That's the noise, so th this process is not perfect. And after all of this uh, alignment, it moves. Everyone moves. And then they align again with their neighbors and so on and so forth. Okay? By a practical uh, thing in the algorithm, uh, between your neighbors, you also count yourself. So if you don't have any neighbors, the algorithm is well defined, but it's not very important. Uh, Okay, so. So in this version of the model, if there is no noise, it would have exactly the average. Well, direction. if you have, there is no noise, it's a very difficult limit. Yes, let's say if uh, your system is very dense, uh, yes, everyone aligns, it's a zero temperature thing. Problem is that if your system, uh, in general, if you have no noise, you are deterministic. Okay, and deterministic dynamics. Uh, is rather difficult uh, since uh, it's not obvious that your mm, dynamics is going to be ergodic. Okay? Who knows what ergodic means? Raise your hand. Yeah, the professor. Where? Okay, ergodic basically means uh, that uh, the system has, in lay, in lay terms, I don't want to write the equation, the system has a well-defined stationary probability distribution, which can be accessed uh, by following for a very long time a typical trajectory. Okay? So it means that uh, ensemble averages on your system are equal to time averages, to long time averages of your system. Okay? But uh, if uh, you have a stochastic system, this is almost granted for sure by the presence of the noise. If you have uh, a deterministic system, this is not uh, obvious. And uh, even the limit where your noise is, 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 uh, is very, very small may, may yield a very, very long time of convergence to the stationary probability distribution. But you can imagine a simple situation where, I don't know, just put yourself on a two-dimensional torus so that you go out of, from here and you enter here. You may have a particle going like this, a particle going like this, Okay, this way, maybe they are encountered. But if they never encounter, they will never synchronize. And so, or you may have different packet going around. So it, it's a very tricky limit, the, the zero noise. Yeah, but uh, there is another version, which is that the deterministic term in one time step does not make you align perfectly. Yeah. But you just rotate towards the direction that the average has. Yeah. And then with more time steps, eventually you get there. In this version, in one time step, yeah, you align yeah, perfectly. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, no, no, sure. There are a lot of variations. And but this makes a lot of difference, or? On the large scale properties, not. Okay? It can change a lot of the details. It can change, of course, uh, the, where the transition lines uh, stay in the phase diagram, and so on and so forth. But let's say there are a lot of simple variations which doesn't matter in, in the kind of properties I will touch. OK, so uh, let's review. What do we have in this model? We have the conservation of particle numbers, which may seem obvious, but is good to, to notice. Uh, your particles self-propelled, so they move, as I told you, and they exchange neighbors. OK, in, in this kind of paradigm, it's, it's important that the interaction radius is much smaller than the system size, OK? Since uh, otherwise, if uh, this, that's your system, and that's your interaction radius. Basically, everyone is interacting with everyone. And uh, by the way, this interaction matrix doesn't change with time, since there is nowhere you can go to escape your neighbors. And, uh, and so this is a different kind of system, basically global interaction. And of course, uh, you can um, spontaneously broken the continuous symmetry uh, to polar order, okay? Note that uh, the kind of uh, interaction we put in the Vichek model doesn't rely on collision. It's basically an interaction at uh, some kind of distance, okay, 
where uh, really it has been inspired by birds. The idea is the bird doesn't collide with the other birds uh, to find the direction of, of where they want to go. They just look at where the other birds are going and copy these directions. And this is, of course, some kind of social force, uh, which is slightly different from the one we are, we are used in uh, condensed matter, in a sense. But these are details. Uh, it really it doesn't matter much on the large-scale behavior. Uh, when you break spontaneously a symmetry, as I told you, the, the blueprint is uh, ferromagnetism, so easing, x, y, and uh, uh, the typical things uh, to, 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 to measure this kind of symmetry breaking, the simplest observable is the polar order parameter. Okay? So, basically, is the average of all uh, the direction of motion of, of your particles. Okay, this is uh, a vector in itself, but when you take the modulo, which is either simple, you get the scalar, and you immediately realize that if everyone is more or less going in the same direction, even if not perfectly, maybe this is... But this kind of thing is going to have uh, a modulo phi, which is uh, some constant uh, clearly finite and larger than one. While uh, if you have a bunch uh, of people who cannot agree on where to go, the average is going to be almost zero. Never going to be zero, of course, unless you have an infinite number of vectors. Okay, in this case, uh, your average is going to be something very small. How small? One over the square root of the number of arrows you're summing up. Okay? This is, again, central limit theorem. It's a consequence of central limit theorem. Okay? Just to tell you that, okay, you, you have to remember this, since if you're looking at a particularly small system, for instance, you will never find clearly a, a clear change between zero and non-zero in this order parameter. Of course, in uh, the limit uh, of a lot of particles, this thing uh, goes to zero. Okay? So this is the most obvious. And this is really what uh, the magnetization does in, in magnetic system. That's the idea. Okay, as I told you, you should remember that these are overdamped models. So for instance, if uh, they are, they, are, they are considering a fixed speed, uh, which is an idealization, as I told you, since uh, uh, it is the balance between uh, a force, uh, an active force, which had get exerted in a certain direction, and the dissipation, which came from the substrate, the fluid uh, in which you're moving, and so on and so forth. Okay? And, uh, of course, this equation fixed uh, as a stationary solution, and it basically fixes uh, V0 as the ratio between uh, the, dissip the, the, the force and the dissipation. Okay? But uh, basically, you may think that you have something which is fluctuating on the bottom of some confining potential. This is, I mean, your speed behaves basically like a particle in a potential, not a Nullenbeck particle, by the way. And the, the, the the, 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 the tighter is uh, your potential, the smallest are the fluctuations, okay? And, and this model basically idealizes uh, and fixes the speed. If you let uh, the speed fluctuate a little bit, nothing is going to change. But also if you let it fluctuate not a little bit, the important thing is that you should not pick up a strong correlation, but if you live in a potential, typically you don't. So nothing changes in the, in the large-scale physics. So this is, in a sense, a harmless idealization. Okay, as I told you, I repeat, uh, the main message of this lecture is that uh, the large-scale properties of your system are totally determined by these uh, fundamental properties I already put down, okay. But 
it's also important to understand things uh, which are not in this model, okay, which may alter stuff. So first of all, this moment doesn't conserve momentum. This is what happens when you move on a substrate, okay? The substrate, uh, anything which moves uh, by friction on some kind of hard substrate, for instance, dissipates momentum in what is to all effect an infinite well. So momentum disappears from your system. Okay. Or maybe, I mean, if you have swimmers, uh, they move in some kind of viscous fluid and they send the momentum to the fluid. Uh, it's the fact that you're sending your momentum to the fluid is not totally harmless, as we will see in a moment. There are situations where this matters and uh, the momentum comes back at you, essentially. Okay? Uh, the fact that you have uh, a preferred, uh, I mean, you have a substrate over which you're moving and you have a speed with zero, which is uh, the speed with respect to the substrate, uh, means that you don't have Galilean invariance in your system, of course. Uh, now, as I told you, if you're dissipating on a substrate, so if you're crawling uh, over something, there is no problem. This model is perfect. If you are in a suspension, there is a little bit of problem since uh, you're transferring your momentum to the fluid and you're generating hydrodynamic flows in the fluid. Okay, and uh, these uh, may generate long range hydrodynamic interaction in your system. Now, this is thought to be more relevant uh, in two situations. Low Reynolds numbers in the Stokes regime, and uh, especially in, th in three dimension, where uh, this, this, this momentum generated in the fluid doesn't get dissipated on the boundaries easily. Point is that if you have a, a fluid which is very narrowly confined in two dimension, the fluid uh, dissipates energy on the confining plates, okay? And this dampens this effect uh, and uh, indeed uh, introduced uh, a screening length, uh, okay? Which is basically decides uh, that uh, uh, your dynamic interaction cannot really act uh, on a long range scale beyond the screening length, okay? Uh, so, there is a typical distinction made uh, in, in the field between uh, uh, what we, wet and dry system, okay? Dry systems means a system where I can ignore the aerodynamic interaction due to momentum conservation in the surrounding fluid, either since there is no surrounding fluid, or either since the screening length uh, is uh, uh, small enough, okay? There are other systems, like three-dimensional suspension, where, especially in the law Reynolds regime, where this is provenly false, and where the dynamic interactions are rather important. And so all of this modelization, of course, uh, doesn't apply to this kind of system, okay? So, in a sense, uh, uh, Having a longer range of dynamic interaction complicates a lot your system, okay? Goes beyond what I'm telling you and much less is known of what happens uh, in this regime. I'm not going to talk about this in these lectures, okay? So, in a sense, I'm talking about uh, dry systems. I'm ignoring uh, momentum conservation. Uh, another issue which I would like to mention, is that uh, uh, there is uh, something else which, um, which may happen when you have system which try to align, is that may be so dense uh, that uh, they approach uh, the, the packing, uh, I mean, they have a high packing fraction and they approach the jam in transition, which means that there are so many particles in your system that they get stuck. Okay, and there, there is another physics uh, entering the game, and also this uh, may change a lot. Note that in the Vichek model, which I'm using as a blueprint, uh, there is no repulsion between particles. Okay, particles are really point particles, and uh, 
uh, so there is not this kind of problem, there is not this kind of, you can stack as many particles as you want in a small volume in the Vichok model and jamming is not going to happen, okay? So in a sense, uh, this is referred as the dilute limit. Even if uh, I will show you that uh, this kind of, the physics which emerge is very good in describing, uh, for instance, experiment uh, done uh, in uh, uh, confluent uh, tissue layer of epithelial cells, which are not exactly dilute uh, in the conventional term. But let's say that as long as your matter flows, uh, what I'm telling you stays relevant, okay? As long as you don't get stuck into jamming. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show you first. Okay, so. Right, it's another movie which maybe is not going to work. Let's try slowly. Okay, so th this is the idea. Now, the first thing you can do when you have a simple model before trying to do some fancy math, because graining or the dynamics, is you run simulation on your computer, as Rodrigo said. So this is a simulation done with uh, a lot of particles, 32 millions. It's on a two-dimensional torus, so you have periodic boundary condition. It's a rather large system with uh, one-eighth of density. And okay, uh, I'm not showing you, if the noise is very high in the system, each particle is not going to synchronize, there is no symmetry breaking, each one is going in his own direction, and that's all. If the noise is sufficiently small, this is what is going to happen. Okay, this is uh, the representation, is a cos grain density field, so each pixel is a small area where I'm counting how many particles there are, and the bluest it is, the more particle you have, the blackest is the absence of particles. So you see that you create some kind of traveling structure, which at the beginning they go in all the possible direction. And by the way, the system was initialized with random position and random orientation. But if you wait long enough, everything starts to move more or less in the same direction. Even if the system is far uh, for being, uh, from being homogeneous at the instantaneous level. So the fact that this particle move creates also some kind of uh, inhomogeneities and structure going on. Ah. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean, quench into order phase? Ah, yes. Okay, it's a technical term, sorry. I, I quenching means that you start morally, when you start with initial conditions which are randomly oriented and uh, uh, uniformly distributed, it's like uh, you have a very, very noisy system. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, in, in equilibrium systems, like you have a very high temperature phase, so you prepare your system in a high temperature, high noise phase, and then you dr immediately drop uh, the, the noise of the temperature. So you're quenching your system. Uh, okay. Uh, how you explain this? Uh, well, there is a very simple mean field argument uh, which, uh, which goes on. So uh, how do you synchronize? Uh, well, think... Uh, you are living in a relatively low density regime. By the way, the, the, the movie I showed you, it was in a low density regime. The density was one eighth. Okay, the two main parameters of your system are the global density, so how many particles you have, and the noise amplitude. Uh, okay, so if you have a, a small density, basically small density means that for a lot of time your particle go around without any neighbors. They are alone. And then sometimes they encounter someone else. What happens when two particles encounter them? Meet, that they align their direction of motion, okay? This is like they're exchanging some information. They meet and they say, okay, where are you going? Ah, oh, let's go there. And uh, after they meet, uh, they start to go more or less in the same direction. And then you have fluctuations. Fluctuations are going uh, to a little bit uh, modify the direction of motion. And after a while, basically by diffusion process, they will separate uh, beyond uh, the interaction range. Okay? 
At that point, uh, they are again alone. They basically exchanged some information. They agreed on a direction, but then they're moving alone. What happens now? Well, there are basically two things. Noise now is very efficient since there is not any more the alignment. They are alone. So noise is really single particle moving along uh, without interaction, like ac uh, active Brownian particle. They change continuously their direction of motion. And uh, after a while, they will forget uh, the direction where they were pointing when they parted. Okay? So after a while, this guy will go by this, and this guy will go by this. Okay? Then maybe they encounter new particles, but if they forgot everything about uh, the original direction, there is no hope of spreading the information. Okay? The system is too noisy. What may happen is that uh, if instead they encounter someone else before forgetting the direction, so maybe they encounter a packet coming like this, now they have uh, a memory of what they agreed on, and they can spread to other particles. Okay, so the information spreads. So basically, there are two time scales which are competing, or two length scales, if you want. Here I put the length scale. One is uh, the typical distance uh, they cover before forgetting uh, where the, 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 the direction they agreed on. And this is the persistent length scale, which is uh, the inverse of the noise amplitude square times uh, the propagation speed. Okay. Note that here I put uh, eta square. So what really plays the role of the temperature is uh, eta square, not eta. But this is due to an historical fact that uh, here eta is the amplitude of the noise in the equation, is not the amplitude of the correlator. The correlator became eta square. When Aparna was correlating noises, Okay, this is discrete. This is uh, delta ij, delta t, t prime, Zach Kronecker delta. Now, in my things, uh, this correlation, if I put uh, the amplitude, would be eta square. Aparna, okay, apart from the fluctuation dissipation thing, had a temperature, okay? So you see that eta square plays the role of the temperature. This is with zero. So this is a persistent length. And then there is this other quantity, which is uh, the mean free path. Okay? This came, came from molecular dynamics, if you want, which is the typical distance you can travel before having another collision event, encountering some, someone else. And we know from kinetic theory that the mean free path in this verse of the density. So it all depends if uh, this mean free path is less than the persistent length, your information is not lost. You go out of a collision with the information, you preserve some of that to the next encounter, and so you, you spread information. Okay? If it's larger, everything is lost. So basically, the, the thing is that uh, when you should have a critical line when these two things are equal. Okay? And uh, this predicts, if you put together the number, that there is a transition noise uh, which is proportional to the square root of the density and the velocity. Okay, and this is more or less uh, satisfied uh, at low densities. Okay, then this argument fails uh, since uh, when you have a high density, you don't have any more of this collision approximation. But this basically explains you with why you get collective motion since. Basically, your system gets, is able to spread the efficient information between all the particles. And when you spread the information, they can take all the same direction. So you basically need a noise, uh, not surprising, which is small enough, or a high density, which is equivalent. OK, this was a slide of a numerical simulation. Rodrigo said all, apart from one thing, uh, which is, uh, uh, yes, it's better to use these tricks, uh, but it's not only better. The point is that uh, if you want to use minimal model in, min in a meaningful way, unless uh, you are exactly sure 
that you really want to study a system which is identical to your minimum to your model. So your there is, but if you want to study a model since it's the abstraction for something else, you know already that uh, what you're accessing are large scale, large, large spatial and temporal scale properties. Okay, so. Since uh, these are the only things uh, which are going to be in common between your minimal model and uh, the system you want to study, provided you got correctly the, the fundamental feature, conservation law, and so forth. But uh, the only things you're getting correctly are the large scale properties. So if you're simulating a microscopic minimal model and uh, you're not large enough, uh, you're not understanding anything. You're only seeing, uh, probably, you're seeing. Uh, uh, specific details of your model which have nothing universal on them, okay? So, just to tell you that uh, when you are studying uh, in a microscopic model, you better going to check for finite size effect, which means uh, you find something, you say, okay, interesting. Let's see if this thing survives if I take a system which is, is twice as large, okay? Four times as large, ten times as large. Only that, at this point, uh, you may start to think that you capture something fundamental, okay? So, and of course, if your simulation are not done in this way, but they scale like the square of a particle, you're in trouble. Okay, so you better learn this kind of techniques. Okay, here we already seen, okay. Now, it's time to uh, discuss the phase diagram of this model, which is a generic feature. So, as I told you, the two main parameters are the strength of the noise and the, t and the mean density of your system. Okay, now, if uh, your noise is large enough or your density is small enough, you are in this phase which is some kind of disordered gas phase, okay? So each particle is going in its own direction. There is no symmetry breaking, and uh, I would say nothing too interesting takes place. Uh, here, if you are high density or uh, low noise, you are in a very interesting phase, which is uh, the equivalent of a liquid, but it's a liquid, so you have a lot of correlation. But it's a liquid which uh, has broken a continuous symmetry. So it's not an ordinary liquid. It's a polar liquid. Okay, and in the middle, very interestingly, this is something which has been realized after a while. There is a coexistent region, okay, where, let's see if I, which is this one, okay? This is a disordered state the disordered gas, this is uh, the ordered uh, liquid, and this is uh, some kind of region where you have a high density band, where in this band all the particles tend to go in the same direction, and then there is a region where there are very few particles which uh, goes in all possible directions. Yes. Uh, Francesco, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to be very clear uh, in about the density. Yes. So if you go back... Please. Um, Where is the phase diagram? The next. Oh, next, yes. Got yes, it. that. The mean density row, how, how I can define it like uh, in a discrete way? Because we are often thinking about the packing fraction, and then for me it's more easy to think about it, like uh, because I have a maximum packing fraction. But now, in the mean density, the packing these fraction numbers... is uh, if you, if your particles have a volume, yeah, uh, let's say in two dimension have a surface mm -hmm. S, that's the surface of a pi, I don't know, pi a square. Mm -hmm. The packing fraction is n pi a square over l square, l square in two dimension. Yeah. Correct. And now the density, how is this defined? Is packing fraction. The yeah. density is. N over L square in two dimension or yeah, LD. So they are basically the same object. Okay. To mm -hmm. a great extent. Okay. But remember, here basically we don't use packing fractions since uh, there is no volume exclusion. 
So, well, they interact, but they can pile up uh, as much as they like. OK, uh, by the way, this phase diagram is very generic, OK? And especially this kind of coexistent region is, uh, I'm going to argue that uh, it's uh, very reminiscent uh, of uh, the coexistence phase you find in equilibrium between uh, gas and the gas and the liquid state in simple liquids. So, uh, in the years, uh, we, 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 we developed the understanding of uh, the transition in this model as a combination of two effects. One, which is uh, the order-disorder transition, which carries a blueprint uh, from magnetic system, and the other is uh, uh, the gas-to-liquid uh, transition of, of simple liquids. So, it, it's some kind of a combination of the two things. You may say it's a shotgun marriage of the two stuff. Okay, so you, you may change a lot of stuff. For instance, you, you may change... Uh, if you use the same models, which is a dilute dry model, and instead of a polar ferromagnetic interaction, you put pneumatic interactions. So your pneumatic interaction means, uh, as I really mentioned, that uh, your arrows uh, like to align, but they don't care uh, of the polar there. So also, this is a good alignment for them, okay? They are also happy in this way. This is, for instance, pneumatic. Pneumatic means uh, that the system is symmetric under rotation by pi of individual particles. Um, they have the same phase diagram. There is some kind of different details, but uh, as long as you are dilute, uh, you have the same kind of structure gas, uh, pneumatic bands, and pneumatic liquid. OK, uh, as a consequence, now I'm not very passionate about this anymore, but uh, there's been uh, years ago a long debate. Uh, the transition seen from the point of view of the order parameter is not uh, a critical transition. OK, it's a weakly first order transition what you really have, okay? And this is exactly due to the fact that you have this phase coexistence and it's exactly what happens in uh, a liquid to gas transition. You may say, in a certain sense, that uh, the fact that you have this phase separation is, is covering, is masking uh, the underlying uh, continuous ferromagnetic transition. Okay, and uh, you have uh, also in this phase, you have metastability phenomena we are going to discuss. Okay, the point is that uh, this kind of uh, instability, sorry, this kind of phase separation uh, only takes place at for very large system sites. And uh, the reason, which I will try to argue in the following lecture at a certain point, is that it is a long wavelength instability, which means that uh, homogeneous phases are stable up to a certain wavelength. Only when you can access, you can probe very large wavelength in your systems, the instability of the homogeneous ordered phase, which is the polar liquid, becomes apparent. So this is the reason why it was missed in, uh, in the first studies of the Vichok model. And this is the reason for which, uh, uh, for instance, I recommend uh, um, to test very large system if uh, you want to access uh, the asymptotic properties. Okay, so in a sense, uh, there are very large finite size effects in, in this kind of system. Little detour. This doesn't mean that uh, the, the behavior of small system is, is not interesting. For instance, uh, this kind of model has been also applied as a blueprint to study uh, mosquitoes Okay, mosquitoes warm. Mosquitoes warm actually don't even break the symmetry. They live very, very close to this transition in the disordered phase. Okay, so a mosquito swarm is not polarly, it is not breaking the symmetry, but it's very close to the symmetry breaking. And mosquito swarms are composed by a few hundred of individuals typically. So they are a small system. They are so small 
that they don't really see this kind of phase separation. Okay. So, in a sense, uh, they are living quite close uh, to be critical. And I'm not going to enter into the details since it's a very new story. This fact has been used by, the, by René Giardini and Andrea Cavagna to study them using uh, RG techniques, uh, which uh, has, has a kind of requirement uh, that your system should be close to a critical point. Okay, so just to say that Final size effects are important, but uh, also small system can be interesting. So, I mean, one should also always be careful of which is the kind of system they want to study. Okay? But uh, if you have system large enough, uh, you have this kind of uh, behavior which became so apparent. Okay, these are details I don't want to enter into. Okay, I just wanted to show you what are what happens in these uh, polar bands regime, or in details, what happens is that you form this kind of structure, which are high-density region, where other particles go in the same direction. So in this high-density region, this is a profile. Take it by, I, I'm taking a vertical average of this picture, and I'm plotting in black uh, the local density, and uh, in red uh, the local order parameter averaged over the length of this band. So where you have the band, you have a peak here going up. Okay, it's not the same system. Sorry, I just put, this is larger, but it's a different system, but it's the same thing. So here I have a peak in density and a peak in global order, and I have two of them, okay? And this object, so... Uh, Yes, just showing you. This is how it looks like. That was, uh, thank you. I was, I was just going to ask if the if the lower plot, the, um, the smaller system plot that you just showed, yeah. uh, the the bands were traveling in the opposite direction. Yes, it will. Yeah, because they are sharp on the front, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I should have flipped, sorry. Yeah, okay. Very smart and, eye, and very the, good. And the decays, is it exponential? Uh, more or less. Well, the, the profile depends on the noise. Uh, it, it's the, there, is, there is a lot of work. It's basically all nonlinear effects. I'm not going to enter into this. There is a very detailed work by Chatet, Solon, Bartolo. I think it's a PRE. You, you, but it's, it's a long story of how much you can say about this. Okay. Uh, if you go to three dimension, as I told you, going to stay mainly in two dimension, but if you go in three dimension, your bands became shit, which travel. They became shit since uh, there is one preferred direction is where you break the symmetry, and uh, the other two directions perpendicular to the broken symmetry one they are equivalent. So there is no symmetry reason for which you should be different going this way or this way. And so you have a sheet which is symmetric in the plane perpendicular to the direction of motion. Now, you may say, this is a curiosity, this is an oddity, why do we care? Well, at least there is an experiment. It's an old one, which I found very interesting. And the experiment is the following. This is uh, done with uh, cytoskeleton filaments, which is what it stays inside the cell, which are extracted to create what is called technically motility assays, which are, well, okay, in the cells, uh, these actin filaments uh, are uh, activated, in a sense, by motor proteins, okay? They are molecular motors which get their energy from ATP, and they transform into tensile forces, they can crawl over the filaments, and so on and so forth. In this experiment, so this is what really happens inside the cell, and this is what essentially creates the activity in the cells. It's the equivalent of the muscular system in, uh, in animals, okay, this kind of structure. In this experiment, uh, what they did was to graft the molecular motors 
on a substrate. So you can think of the molecular matters of little things which like to work. So the molecular matters do like something like this. Okay, they are touched down and they move like this. And then they, they put these uh, filaments on top of that. Okay, and they give ATP. And the filaments have a chirality, which means that uh, when they, they are on the molecular matters, they move in a well-defined direction. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I will make a question about the, the previous slide. Because yes. I'm to, uh, but uh, you said that the sheet polarizes in one direction. Why, in, in, even in 3D, why I can get like a spherical sheet? Like no, no, it's not. It, it's a flat sheet. It's, uh, but but why, it, it, why yeah. it is, is a flat? Because they, they, can pol they could polarize in like a spheric way or to the... You, you, to you the mean that they, they can yes, bend? Like yes. Okay, no, no, no. The, 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 this is possible too. Or just they can bend, but the, the fact is... Okay, this is a little bit more complicated. It's due to the fact that uh, once uh, you're all going uh, in this direction, so you have a sequence of particles all going in this direction, let's say, and you have fluctuations. So you have small fluctuation. Let's say the fluctuation, I call it delta theta. OK. How do they change uh, this uh, velocity? Well, they change in a direction which is perpendicular to the direction of motion, and in a direction which is longitudinal to the direction of motion. OK. Trigonometry, what is this and what is this? This uh, is given by a sine of delta theta. Okay. These fluctuations uh, is given by 1 minus the cosine of delta theta. What happens? Uh, if I have a small fluctuations, so delta theta is smaller. That if I expand the sign, this object is proportional to delta theta. If I expand the cosine, this is one, but it cancels with this one here, minus uh, delta theta square, okay, divided by two. So what I'm telling you is that these fluctuations are very small compared to this. Okay, so what it means that uh, once you have a band, the particle well, in a sense diffuse laterally. So if you have something which is done like this, it's not stable. It's a straight thing is more stable. Nevertheless, now we're showing something which is not straight, which is this experiment here. OK, so I was telling you, you put the molecular motors, you graph something on top of that. And the effect is basically this one, crowd surfing, okay? when you give a TP. Now I'm finishing. And uh, that's an experiment. Okay, but some of this filament has been uh, made fluorescent, and uh, you change the density, and you change the density, you go through different states. Of course, when the density is high enough, you have these traveling structures. Okay? This is exactly the kind of instability you see in the Dicek model. This is a rather more complicated system, okay? There are, I mean, you have extended objects, you have volume exclusive interaction, there is some kind of uh, solvent uh, around uh, your system. So the forces are more complicated, and this is probably what uh, bends a little bit your structure. But my point uh, is that uh, this kind of uh, instability, which uh, forbids uh, some kind of homogeneous order but creates band, uh, it's also acting in this uh, experimental system. Okay? So this is a proof, in a sense, that a very, very simple model can capture to a certain degree of approximation. So if you want, the equivalence, uh, the, 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 the description is more qualitative than quantitative. Is not exactly the same object, but it's very similar. It captures this idea that you have phase separation and you have bands. 
Okay, uh, if you give me three more minutes, I finish otherwise this section. Okay, now, the, to finish this part, I just note very quickly that you don't have single bands, typically you may have many of them, which can arrange in a parallel configuration, which is ordered and resembles MACTIG interaction with Julia showed this morning. They can have more complicated particles uh, uh, close to the liquid threshold. So if you get very close to became more homogeneous. And they have well-defined structure as uh, he was mentioning, okay? Uh, the main message of this, uh, of this analysis, which uh, has been done very carefully analyzing uh, really nonlinear effect uh, in, in, in the mesoscopic equation you can derive, is that, okay, I, I spare you the details, I just go to the conclusion, that uh, this kind of phase, uh, of coexistence phase, has a lot of similarity to what you get uh, in the coexistence phase of a liquid gas uh, system, of a simple liquid at the liquid gas transition, okay? So you have... Uh, Spinodal decomposition, which means that you have a linear instability which is driving uh, your, your instability. But uh, outside that, uh, you have nucleation phenomena. Okay? So it means that uh, outside the spinodal region, you can still create this coexistence, but uh, droplets of liquid uh, have to, 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 to pass a certain threshold uh, to stabilize inside the gas and vice versa. Inside the, the liquid, uh, bubbles uh, of gas uh, need to pass a certain threshold by nucleation to stabilize. To stabilize, you have uh, metastability phenomena and hysteresis regimes, uh, which are shown here in the behavior of the order parameters, for instance. You may apply the level rules, uh, which uh, you have in, in, in equilibrium liquids, which tells you how you can determine the liquid fraction, checking the global density, the gas density, and the liquid density, okay? And in general, you have a phase diagram which is very reminiscent of uh, liquid gas, which I'm plotting here below. Here in red, uh, you have uh, the border of this liquid plus gas region, which are called bionodal technically. Inside, uh, you have this dashed line, which are the lines where the instability pass from being a nucleation instability, where you have to pass the threshold, to a linear instability, which means that it's much faster and it appears by linear growth. It's a so perturbation growth linearly. We are going to see in the next lecture how this linear mechanism can be derived at the linear level, so being a linear mechanism. And normally, if you have a liquid gas phase transition, you have... Uh, this kind of phase diagram in black with the binodal and the spinodal. And as you know, certain point you have uh, a critical point, which is uh, the critical point of liquids. And uh, there is a critical point since certain point you can pass, you can go around this critical point in your phase plane and you can pass from the gas to the liquid and vice versa without uh, any, in a sense, discontinuity, okay? It becomes the same thing. In our system, you have to remember that this is not only liquid gas, but it's also, it's also order disorder. And the order disorder has this peculiarity, which there is a dramatic change of symmetry. You pass from an isotropic symmetry to you break the symmetry and you get polar. So there is no way you can move between liquid and gas without realizing. And this implies that uh, these uh, critical point disappears, or you can say that you get pushed to infinity. So you have this kind of diagram where these two lines, uh, this two binodal line meets only at infinity. So it becomes non-reachable. Okay, and here I stop. So this is uh, the picture of uh, the phase transition, which is a mixture of uh, basically it's a transition between uh, a disordered gas uh, and the polar liquid, okay? So it's a mixture of two different effects. This is a good point where to stop. 
And Wednesday, at this point, and not tomorrow since I don't have any lecture, I will discuss uh, the polar liquid phase. I will leave the transition, which is an historical importance, and I will go deep uh, in this polar ordered phase, which is really describes the physics of system which does collective motion with a good degrees of water. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francesco, for this amazing lecture. I have a simple question, actually, a curiosity. Uh, yeah. um, which is the dependence of initial condition in a small density regime? Do we have a, one kind of uh, bistability behavior of the system? Well, now. There is a phase diagram. So, if you have uh, a very low density system, just that, uh, so, okay, the density is here. I, I'm masking with my. Here, in principle, you still have these three phases. Uh, the dynamics can be a little bit slow since the, the system is very dilute. Well, in general, first of all, if the density is very low, you should also push uh, your noise to very low level if you want, would like to see um, disordered liquid phase. Yeah. And so also, at low, very low noise, your dynamics, uh, your, your time to reach, uh, to reach a stationary regime is extremely long. So I, I would say that there is nothing different uh, in the large scale limit. Yeah. But of course, uh, uh, there is a lot of difference at very, very short time Actually, scales. I mean in the sense if we start the system, uh, put all particles together mm -hmm. in ah, high okay, noise, ah, okay. for sorry, example. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is an over... Yeah, this, this, this is strictly with zero density. Oh, yeah. This is a very stability in this sense. This is a very interesting story, which I'm actually working on. Uh, still, the, the, the point is that if you start uh, your particle in an open space, so you have a finite number of particles in an infinite space. This is technically zero density, and there is no way they are going to order, and actually they are going to disintegrate, since fluctuation will, or will always put them apart. So you may wonder how birds manage to stay together since they live in infinite space. Of course, they have, on top of the alignment, they have a second kind of interaction, which is cohesion. It's basically an interaction which tells them not only I want to align with my neighbors, but also I go a little bit towards uh, where they are. And this is what keeps them together. There are models where this can be realized. The, well, the, the very first model of flocking, before statistical physics got interesting, was Reynolds, Craig Reynolds who was a computer scientist, and he wanted to do an algorithm which later has been used, for instance, in the Lion King movie. And it, his algorithm, the particle does three things. A particle has uh, a repulsion region where he moves away from the neighbors. It has an alignment region where it aligns, and it has a, a cohesion region where It doesn't care to go in the same direction as the other, but it goes towards the other, for instance. And, and, and these keep them together. There are other ways. Now, th there is a delicate point since, uh, OK, Rodrigo mentioned uh, the, um, the pair correlation function today. OK? So this pair correlation function has been measured in birds. In birds, uh, the percolation function is something like this. OK, this is uh, the distance between particles. This is the probability of finding another particle. <sighs> this is not what you observe typically in liquids. In liquids, uh, you observe uh, a more oscillating structure, OK, which is shells. Many models. Uh, 
of cohesion we know these days tends to reproduce this yellow line. Okay, so uh, we are working, for instance, how you can have uh, some kind of cohesion without this, these features, which are basically the shell of a liquid. And uh, the, the basic idea is that uh, you always like to go towards your neighbor. There is no kind of equilibrium distance. So it's not something like the Leonard Johnson potential, which is something like this. But it's just uh, wherever you are, you align with your neighbors and also go a little bit towards them. And the farther you are, the more interested you are in going towards your neighbor and less in aligning. But yeah, this is not totally so clear. We in this sense, we have um, a small density, think in periodical boundary conditions, and we have a um, high noise, for example. So the stationary behavior of the system would, be de would depend on these initial conditions. Uh, because if we start randomly, no, for no, example. No, I mean, if, if you don't have cohesion, your particles are going to, to spread homogeneously in your system. You, are, uh, you have a high noise, uh, you are not going to order, you stay in this gas phase, sure. and you have just uniform distribution of particles with a uniform distribution of direction. But if we start all particles together, the system will, will flock. For, in, a, for, a short, for a short time, and then poof, it will disorder. Oh. Since anyhow, fluctuations spread it over all the possible space, unless you put these uh, cohesion forces. But. So what's the hysteresis cycle that you showed before? Isn't this some sort of dependence on initial conditions? Mm, well, it's basically how you do hysteresis. So where, is, where was it? So I am... Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, here. So is, 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 is a typical thing. Here I have a control parameter. Here it's, it's this noise amplitude. In an equilibrium system would be a temperature. I, I don't know, I start uh, at high temperature, high noise. I very, very slowly, adiabatically reduce the temperature, which means I reduce a little bit, I wait, so that the system reach the stationary states. Here, I reduce a little bit very slowly. Here, here. Now, when I'm here, and if I'm coming from the disordered region, I reduce the noise, I stay disordered. I reduce the noise, I stay disordered. And then at a certain point, okay, I reduce too much and I jump up. And I get ordered. Then I reduce again more and I follow this curve. Then I go back, increase the noise very slowly, very slowly, very slowly. Now here I'm not retracing my, my way of, from which I came, but uh, I overshoot. Here, I stay ordered, I stay ordered, I stay ordered, and then at the, only at this point, I drop. So there is an hysteresis loop. Of course, these states here, up and down on the loop, are metastable, which means that if I have a finance system, I wait for a very, very long time, I'm going to see a jump, okay? And this here, I'm reporting the jumping time as a function of the noise, for instance. Okay, so to uh, conclude like the question, um, the initial condition matters if you are worried about the metastable state. Yeah, yeah, of course. But of for course. the true equilibrium state, it doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, exactly. This, but okay, but this is slightly different if you want that. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, he, since here I'm really close to the transition. If you are far away from the transition, you, you, you will, I mean, if you start, uh, let's say, uh, highly ordered here, you will drop immediately. So I, if you, if you have very low density, very high noise, uh, or noise, I mean, you just drop. You, you have to be close to this uh, transition to, to see these terraces. Yeah. Yes, I, I want to ask you about uh, the stability of the, this like, propagation fronts that you, that you can observe in the polar bands. Mm -hmm. Like, if you add an, an obstacle or another band in the opposite direction, or yeah. Now, well, if you add another, I mean, there has been a lot of studies. Uh, apparently, this system is very sensible towards obstacles. 
So small disordering obstacles, there is a recent work by Chatea and collaborators where she shows that small obstacles destroy everything. On the other hand, there are many instances in which if you have different bands, they can traverse one with each other. So the, the dynamics of this uh, phase uh, coexistence is very, very complicated in a sense. And ah, uh, I haven't mentioned one thing. I wrote it, but I forgot to mention. Sorry. Oh, it was written here. Uh, I said it's a phase separation, but exactly the fact that there is very rich dynamics tells you it's slightly different from what you obtain in equilibrium liquids. In equilibrium liquids, you have one liquid phase and one gas phase which coexist. They're all together. Here, you have this, what we call microphase separation, since you have a lot of different bands. They are not clamped in a single phase. It's a much more complicated structure, which is another difference, if you want, with equilibrium. It's, it's a very complex dynamics. There are a lot of studies. I, I don't think we, we got at the bottom of that. Uh, sometimes people find new stuff. So I have a question myself about this. You can have microphase separation, but can you also have macrophase separation in these systems? Depending uh, on some ingredients? In, I'm showing tomorrow an example where well, it was going to be a question, but... Okay. Sorry. Uh, no, no, okay, but uh, I mean, a, a, an exercise is for you. Yeah, uh, now, uh, in this system, you can have uh, uh, macrophase separation if you remove uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking. I will show you, but uh, it's driven by the fluctuation. It's very complex to understand why you have micro instead of macro. And it seems to be driven by the specific nature of the fluctuation you put in the system. Yeah, I it's wonder. It's non-trivial stuff. I'm wondering whether this is connected to the fact that immotility-induced phase separation for active lattice gases, mm -hmm. without translational noise, you have micro phase separation. If you add translational noise, you get macro phase separation. Um, yes, maybe it's connected in the sense that. If you add translational noise, you're putting a different kind of noise. I mean, maybe you mask uh, some underlying uh, fluctuations. Yeah, you round so. the clusters instead of making percolating clusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be... Uh, now, here, for instance, by, by the way, in this model, there is no translational noise. Uh, all I show you is robust uh, if you add a little bit of translational noise. If you add a lot, uh, you destroy these bands. But if you add a little bit of translational noise, this kind of thing uh, survives, but depends on how much. So, of course, there is a competition between uh, fluctuation types. So, more questions? Okay, so let's thank Janelle again. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have a question for you. So, tomorrow we have a tutorial session. Now, the very unfortunate thing uh, of the stuff, uh, of the way I, I decided to do this lecture is that I don't have any analytical exercises which I can give you yet, since uh, this is phenomenology. So the only exercises I can give you uh, now, that for the next uh, tutorial lecture you will have something, if you're interested, is run a big check algorithm. Write it uh, and uh, try maybe, this is more complicated, try to, um, to write uh, one using these molecular dynamics tricks or dividing your system into boxes and see for yourself a little bit of phenomenology. Of course, it's a lot of work, so it's up to you. Uh, you will have more analytical uh, pen and paper exercises on Thursday, but... Uh, so if you're interested, uh, think about that or came to talk with me if you want to set down an algorithm. I can give you some ideas. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, just a few announcements. A reminder of the WhatsApp group of the event, if anyone wants to join, just send a message to